episode of One Take. It's no longer One Take with Andrew. It's also One Take with Dean Dan Rodriguez, who's here at Ross HQ in San Francisco. And we're actually in uh, one of my favorite conference rooms here, what we call the bunker. So uh, as you can see with the uh, concrete background, we've been having a fun day of meetings. Um, I'm going to hop right into things, um, Dan. In terms thanks of, for hosting me. Yeah, thanks, for being yeah, here, thanks, thanks for being here. Um, I think what I always like chatting about, as you know, is ways that law school students um, can start being exposed to different legal technology tools. I don't think it's the end all be all. I think you, there's a whole bunch of things that makes a great lawyer and a great law school student. But what have you seen working with law schools when kind of being a little bit more innovative as everyone likes to talk about? And in terms of what's working with legal technology right now at law schools, what are you seeing? Well, I'm a believer in the, in the marketplace and mm. the market is telling us, yeah. by us I mean the law students and, and, and the legal academy, that we need to adapt mm. in order to survive. Mm. What that basically means is developing a philosophy, an educational philosophy, that understands that our students are entering a world in which they're going to be working at the intersection of law, business, and technology. Right. Now that doesn't sound like such a radical proposition, except for years and years and years and decades, law schools have thought of themselves as essentially in their own silo. Yep. You need to have a license to practice law. In the United States, that means three years of a JD program, mm -hmm. learning, and I hate this phrase, yeah. to think like a lawyer, as yeah. it were. And then folks in business school learn management, folks in the technology sector learn technology. Mm -hmm. That's not working. That's not working because I say so. That's not working because employers are increasingly telling our students, we need you to know how to navigate and negotiate technology. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean necessarily that you have to learn to code, no. but it has to mean that you have to uh, not have a fear of mm -hmm. developments of technology. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to, to have uh, uh, flexibility to work in the C-suite yeah. and work with managers on yeah. developing uh, developing these kinds of skills. And so I think, I think law schools are really uh, working at the forefront of, uh, of a lot of those innovations. That makes a lot of sense. I think one of the things I always like about um, talking about technology in law schools is it's kind of a fun hack to expose students to, like you mentioned, business thinking, um, uh, working as a team and managing a product. And even if they never go on and ever do anything with legal technology in terms of like in, instituting it at their firm or in their organization, et cetera, I think it does in a way help kind of marry the different areas of um, kind of what their mind should be going towards, being that business, being that technology and collaboration. And so I think it's fun. It's like, it's a good way to start having folks work um, and learn things that they should and that firms now are requiring in many ways sure. that they learn. What do you think are some of the biggest challenges though in doing that? Because like you said, it's not like um, something that is, uh, when you say it, it makes total sense. And that's usually when you have a good idea. Usually when you tell someone something they say it makes sense. Right. But what is stopping that or what are some of the challenges that you've seen um, and, and kind of um, and maybe some of the ways to overcome them could be fun as well. Well, there's a lot of challenges. They're all surmountable, so that's yeah, a good news. That's great. The last <laughs> that's version. good. But we have challenges. So yeah. one is that the, again, the traditional educational model of, of, of law school. And and let me let me bring two cheers on behalf yeah. of the educational model. We've we've thrived as a society largely because law schools in the aggregate have been very effective at training lawyers for not only to, to perform at a very high level, mm -hmm. but to adapt to a new economy. Mm -hmm. So uh, the three years of law school uh, in the JD model in the United States gets a lot of criticism, but the bottom line is we spend the first year in foundational, fundamental legal knowledge yeah. organized around, around themes that have, that have uh, st stood the test of time. Yeah. We do much of that supplementary work in the second and third year, but for all of that, What's crowded out mm -hmm. is the development of experiential learning, even though schools are, are developing a lot yeah. of those challenges. Yeah. But you asked about challenges. Yeah. I think it's the existing educational model of, uh, of law schools yeah. that's, that's sort of stood in the way. And I, I would say as a footnote, probably a yeah. big footnote, yeah. has been the intransigence of many, not all, yeah. uh, but many faculty members yeah. to, to new ways of thinking and new ways of adapting their skills to a changing marketplace, which quite frankly, they haven't... Uh, myself yeah. included, been part of yeah. for many, many years because they've been in the uh, in the ivory tower. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I love our conversations because I'm like, uh, we could speak forever on this, but I, I definitely agree with you. I think one of the things that we even saw with Ross early on was forget about talking about what it can do, forget about talking about all that stuff. We had to almost have a conversation about changing the way people thought about the practice of law. And it's really when people ask me who, you know, um, venture capitalists and, you know, 
one of the common questions you get is, so who are your biggest competitors and what's that? And what I always say is it's the old way of thinking is our biggest competitor. And, uh, and that's what we've been trying to battle by doing things like our blog and this video series, trying to bring out education and having folks talk about it. And once folks do, as you've seen as well, it's like, oh, we actually, you don't have, one thing doesn't have to disappear for the other thing to win. It's a matter of, okay, how can we marry these two ideas of thought? the practice of law, the theory of law, the instruction of law, this all can exist in harmony. And I, I find now what, what's always so exciting is that we're seeing that progress with a whole bunch of different schools leading the way. And I, I'm really excited about that. The last thing I guess I'd like to chat with you about is, you know, um, I actually gave you a sneak peek a little bit mm -hmm. on some of the new cool yeah. stuff that we're, we're, we're releasing. What, and it doesn't have to be Ross related, but you know, what are you excited about right now, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's not, about the next five, 10 years when it comes to law, not just the, it, it, not just the practice. I also want to hear your take even from a law school perspective as well as in the practice. Well, you mentioned the theory of the law, and I, I want to say that a lot of the developments that I'm really excited about in deep learning mm -hmm. and artificial intelligence and a lot of the various uh, uh, activities that are either at the periphery or the core of those developments is not only does it provide a, a, a much greater efficiency, for young lawyers and lawyers generally to be able to provide services for clients, which of course, bottom line is that's what we're in the business of doing. Mm -hmm. But it also destabilizes the traditional attitude about theories of law and legal reasoning. Right. So when you have the capacity to really, as, as, as Ross has really mm -hmm. been pioneering, to expand the scope of the kinds of searches you can do, yeah. to use natural language processing to learn, to all the, yeah. all the techniques and, and all the developments that are really quite excited about AI. Yeah. It helps us think about lawyering in a very different way because what we're doing is developing human skills. So we're not gonna have our jobs replaced by no. robots no. anytime they, yeah. we're de deploying human skills but in a much more efficient way to learn about legal reform, to increase access to justice, yeah. to level the playing field, yes. to do the kinds of things that we speak a lot about in, in law schools and yeah. legal education. But so far, until fairly recently, we haven't had the technology to be able to, to really marry those goals with, uh, with key objectives. I, I love, very well put. I think what, one thing that I've seen happen with you know, something like a system like AlphaGo playing Go, mm -hmm. what ended up happening, and it continues to happen, is human um, opponents are using some of the new stuff that the AI is doing, and it's kind of causing this back and forth, and it's pushing the development of the game and, and advancing that dramatically. True. Because eventually all those human players would have played you know, a whole bunch of games and perhaps a new methodology or a new strategy well, would have emerged. Deep Blue didn't put chess out of business. Exactly. Uh, the, uh, Watson didn't put uh, Jeopardy out of no. business. There's still Go players around the world. Exactly. So the, the traditional lawyering, well traditional lawyering may be yes, put out of business, sure. depending on how we define traditional. Sure. But lawyering is not gonna put, uh, be put out of business. And the key point is human judgment is always gonna be not only salient, but, but absolutely instrumental. And indeed, yeah. a lot of these developments, to, 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 to make an obvious yeah. point, a lot of these developments in AI wouldn't be possible, but for human agency in academia, I love it. In, in, uh, with, with really smart folks developing this technology for great human purposes. Uh, you know, I think that's going to be how we wrap it up. I always say that the fun part of artificial intelligence is that it's going to allow us to actually advance our human skills. And the, the, the future of AI, I always say, is, is human. And so thank you so much for a, you know, being on this one take. Um, folks out there, if you don't follow Dan on Twitter, you're missing out. Um, you got to get uh, and follow him. He, he's also conversational there, meaning if you actually have any questions based off of some of the things you've heard in this, co this conversation, you can pick that up and we'll actually, you know, me and Dan do a whole bunch of stuff on Twitter that way. So get out there, follow Dan, as well as if you'd like to uh, check me out, um, it'll be down in the bottom of this box as well. If you have any questions for a one take, ask away. You can also email them in, tweet them in, etc. Maybe even a carrier pigeon. Thanks so much and take care.